I just want to make a little quick video here, which is about um, phenomenology and logical positivism. Um, it's, you know, it's kind of interesting. If you read logical positivism, and when I say logical positivism, I'm talking about, um, you know, Bertrand Russell and Lud Ludwig Wittgenstein founding it somewhat, being their god, being the godfather, but really the Vienna Circle and Moritz Schlick and uh, Rudolf Carnap and, um, you know, those guys founding it, really. Um, the Vienna Circle, starting with that, it was kind of, I have a video on that. What's going on there is they have a paper that they all write together called Die Wiener Kreis, and uh, it's about the uh, scientific con conception of the world. Um, so, it's about eliminating metaphysics and, the and theology because they don't have meanings. Uh, what what they say that doesn't really mean anything, it's not empirically verifiable, so they're, they're like the neo-empiricists, kind of. Um, and we need to, in in order to, f to figure out whether something has just, basically the whole, you know, the whole mantra that they had was justification conditions, that the conditions under with, uh, which a certain thing can be justified is the same thing as the conditions under which something could be, um, meaningful is, is the same thing as the conditions under which a certain thing could be verifiable. And that's all truth conditions, the, the, condition, the conditions under which, which something could be true. So it's all about that, and it's about empirical ver verification. And ver verificationism is saying that if we can't verify it empirically, then we cannot get just, we cannot be justified in it, um, we can't find meaning in it, and we cannot figure out whether it's true or not because it doesn't have a true value. It's ambivalent, meaningless, says nothing within the empirical world. Um, and the main, art, the main article I'm thinking about is uh, the ones from Carnap, Otto Neurath, Marsh Schlick, A.J. Ayer. Um, you know, there's a, and there's a couple others, but those are the, the main guys. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot more than that, but those are the big ones. Um, so I guess what I'm thinking about here is, is how does this relate to phenomenology? Uh, Carnap, in his article, the elimination of metaphysics through logical analysis, what he does is he quotes Martin Heidegger's Vastis Metaphysic, and he uh, says he kind of quotes a part where he's where, where he's where Heidegger is talking about the nothing, and he quotes the part where Heidegger says the nothing nothings, and he says, well, that what does that mean? That that really, that really doesn't really have any meaning, you know. So we can't verify whether this is true or false. We can't really do anything there. And he kind of creates linguistic frameworks and he does all that stuff. And he kind of creates a picture as to how we go go from observation statements of certain sense sense data and move up, move up to move up to protocol sentences. Um, you know, writing down of a observation statement, moving up to coordinate to the definitions about th th thing language, up to sci sci scientific and mathematical languages. You know, and moving up to having knowledges, knowledges about the world, which is beaten into the foundation of observation experience. Um, so I guess my question, with respect, is is what? How does this? work with with respect to phenomenology <sighs> phenomenology does a similar thing it says that phenomenology perception or experience whatever you want to call it um, is the focus the starting point consciousness and per perceiving phenomena to the things themselves Husserl said um, so how does this relate are they opposing views or are they more you know, similar because of their same focus point. Um, but then we, if, we, if we get Otto, Otto Neurath later, uh, who kind of took that observation statement part at the bottom, um, at the bottom of that picture and uh, somewhat, you know, got all coherentist about meaning and justification and truth when it comes to, you know, 
how we get to some sort of knowledge. Um, and he had the metaphors of like like Norath's ship and Norath's sorting machine and such. Um, so I guess my question is, with respect to phenomenology, which I have multiple multiple videos about, um, and there's various other resources besides just my videos, there's so there's <laughs> a million more resources that are probably better. <laughs> I'm not, cause I'm not gonna, you know, I'm, I, I am my biggest critic. Um, um, so the question is. Does phenomenology well, the way to way, the way to compare the two is, does phenomenology employ any well in Carnap in Carnap's uh, essay the elimination of metaphysics he says that most of metaphysics what it does is it, it makes gr grammatical and syntactical errors um, where either they put a word in there that doesn't have meaning. Like he uses the example of TV and Tuvi, and he, you, well, the word TV, he kind of shows as when that's implemented, where a de definition for it is not given, you know, there's no way to verify it or to get its meaning or its truth or, val truth or false conditions. <sighs> so we had the, the condition of something being meaningless where a word is used, where a definition is not given, so we can't verify meaning or truth or ju justification about it. The second case is where we have a bunch of words together that have meanings, but they're, syn they're syntactical combination doesn't work. Similar to uh, the phrase, uh, how much did my dream weigh? How much did, did or like I, I had a, I had a dream last night? How much did it, did it weigh? Weight is not a predicate that you can ascribe to something like a dream, um, so that the words together don't make sense. So that those are the two kinds of ways that the, the, the metaphysics physics can uh, make mistakes. So let's think about this with, with respect to phenomenology. Does phenomenology do anything like this? Um, I would say with respect to the ego, Hus Husserl's ego, definition for that is given, I would say, um, and intentionality, a, a definition is given. Um, I would say in Husserl, in all of Husserl, this is not committed. Husserl had his roots in um, mathematics and philosophy of, of, of mathematics. He, he corresponded with Gallup Frege about mathematics. His first book was about mathematics or arithmetic. So, Husserl does not, as far as I know, commit any of that. Every word that I've read, and I've read the logical investigations, the ideas in the, you know, the, you know, the combined form, uh, the uh, Cartesian meditations, the crisis of European sciences, experience and judgment, formal which for transcendent logic, um, and uh, phenomenology of the consciousness of internal time. I've read all of those. Um, I, I've read. I haven't read so much as a formal transcendent logic as I believe I had, but anyway, I've read, I've read, I've read the rest of them, and in in all of those, I don't believe there has ever been a case like that. In Heidegger, on the other hand, once we get past Husserl, it does get a little more unclear. When you we read this book, Zion and Sight, this is the McQuarrie translation, um, being in time. We do have a question as to what some of these things mean. Um, for instance, let's let me find a part here that I highlighted that can be a good example. Desevering amounts to making the farness vanish, that is, making the remoteness of something disappear, bringing it close. 
desevering or deseverance. Design is essentially deseverant. It is le le it lets any entity be encountered close by it as the entity which it is. Deseverance dis discovers remoteness. Okay, so in this in this part, which is in the third chapter of the first vision uh, of the first, uh, yeah, something like that. Uh, it's the one about. Uh, I believe it's the one about uh, worldhood and such. Yeah, the 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 worldhood of the world is where I is where I found that. Um, a lot of those words don't have definitions. Um, and, you know, this part where he talks about dissevering, you know, uh, number tw number section twenty three of chapter three here. <laughs> Talks about dissevering and deseverance, and the and the deseverant. Um, that's one example out of Heidegger, um, which you know has has some issues as to you know, and it, as it is with with really any Heideggerian work. Um, so some phenomenology, you know, does run into that issue. Some of it does. Um, because in Heidegger, someone who or someone who is in who has their roots in analytic philosophy is not going to read Heidegger and immediately know what, what's going on. And I'm not saying that that's how one gains meaning is having roots in whatever philosophy has to know what a certain thing means. But you know, someone who is good at finding meaning of things, yet in a certain analytic philosopher. You know, and just picks up Heidegger and tries to read it, is going to be, I don't know what the hell this, this shit means. You know, and on Heideggerian texts, inter interpretations are given, um, things are, are said about it, um, p secondary sources are written about it, and, uh, you know, we have a sort of a consensus about what Heidegger is saying, a sort of consensus. You know, but we don't really have an immediately um, an immediate ver verification of the meaning and truth conditions of certain things he says. <laughs> so, some phenomenology that does employ some things that are out of reach of meaning, truth, and verification, and ju justification conditions. You know, uh, so maybe in phenomenology we should return to those things that don't have that those issues. Anyway, this this is just a little rant about that. Because um, I think they are very similar in that they are somewhat neo-empiricist. But the empiricists would be very different um, you know, than a phenomenologist would. Anyway, that's kind of a very vague connection, which is probably I probably shouldn't have given. Um, thanks.